in uh, Riruta, St. John's Parish, Riruta here. He was a poor boy, so he was able to, to have time to be educated by Alice Foxley. It's amazing, Alice Foxley was an English lady who was sent by the priests from St. Austin's to start the mission. He, she lived there, Riruta, St. John's. So she gathered a few children who were poor around and she taught them catechism and they were baptized, I think in 1913 or so. So he was one of those. Now when, and he was educated and he, he became even a printer in the government printers. And uh, later on he became an important person having started as a poor boy. Now, when Loreto sisters came to Limuru, 1936, the priests asked the, the Christians at that time to give them girls. They didn't want, they were forced. So, so my grandfather sent his daughter, eventually he sent all his five daughters to Limuru, Loreto Limuru. You see, they were forced in the beginning and they used to run away. And my mother was the second, <laughs> was the second lot to go to Limuru, you see. So I know Limuru from the very beginning because I would hear my mother saying how, what the sisters were like, Sister Veronica, Sister Dolores, Sister Teresa Joseph. They had lots of stories, Sister Fidelis, those early ones, Sister Veronica. Can you remember and any of those stories? Uh, oh, you see, the thing is, they didn't understand each other. The nuns didn't know ki Kiswahili and the girls didn't know English. So <laughs> they were teaching each other. My, my, my aunt, they were teaching... No, it was hard. Limuru was cold. Now they were on cement floor without shoes and they were used to being at home in a hut. You know, earthen floor is warm around a fire. So the girls suffered, they would run away. Then uh, it, the whole thing was a whole mixture of very interesting things. Uh, I, I understood both sides. You see, now they told me some funny things. Then the nuns kept chickens and the chickens would hi hide under the hedges. So if you got a chicken and brought an egg, you got a bowl of soup from the sisters, some funny things like that. So they, they nearly almost squeezed the eggs out of the hands, they would tell me. <laughs> and they would say, so and so had such long legs, she always caught the chickens and brought in the... You know, they had very funny, it was a bit difficult for both sides. One time all the children ran away. Now, my mother in this, they would escort the one who is running away. You know, Limur is not far from here. Kiambu, they came from Kiambu, those who were cooks. The cook of the priest bring one daughter. The cook of this parish priest bring another daughter by force. Now, anyway, they, when somebody runs away, the others would come, escort them for five kilometers, carrying their bags, then come back and the, that one would go away. <laughs> so those are some of the funny, and they used to cook for themselves, Limuru. And in the dance, they didn't, the girls also were young, didn't know you cut firewood in the villages and you put it in the sun for some time to dry, you know. But this once, the girls would cut the wood then put it when it's green and the smoke. Then when they are cooking, <laughs> they said the nuns would come, Sister Veronica would come to see how the food is cooking and the nuns, the girls would have stolen some extra food and put it on the pot. So when she comes to open the lid, they would have some bitter leaves, herbs around, and they would put them in. Then the smoke would be so bitter, sister wouldn't be able to, to, ch <laughs> to check the food. Oh no, they had some funny things. Now, then they would have food remaining, then sister the next day would reduce the food. Then they, they made a, a, a hole in the store where one of the little ones would fit and put them in to steal some more food, grains. So they would put her in, then sister would find the food is too much, reduce it. They didn't know how <laughs> so those are some of them. But I used to enjoy it, my mother telling us what happened in, in the school. Can you remember anything about Sister Teresa Joseph? Uh, Teresa Joseph, I think it is well known that she was very curly, curly, 
means a bad tempered. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but but uh, I found her the same even later on. Teresa Joseph, and you know what? She was tough, but they loved her and they all talked about her. It's amazing. They all remembered her. But you know those days we got a bit of working. Mm -hmm. They would get a bit of working. <laughs> but Teresa Joseph was a great educator. And they wanted the Africans to be educated. They really wanted the Africans. And they did a good job because Father really corner some of the earliest women leaders in this country were all from Limuru. They, I mean, it's, it's true. Like, you would have the secretary to the minister or... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. They are, were great women. But somehow, I'm not surprised because if they came from Nyeri or Muranga or Kisumu, wherever they came from, I think they would have already been shifted in the community. Those girls, like Wangari Madai, they would have been shifted already to, to survive all that and land in Liburu. <laughs> so they, they really, but life was tough. So was the world. You know, life was not easy, like warm water, socks in their the feet. You know, the bare feet, even myself when I went, to, later on, I went to Limuru. And uh, even then, some girls didn't have shoes. We never knew something like hot water bottle. It was tough, but we didn't think it was. So it was the same at home. So some of the things I remember, when I later on went to teach in Loreto Limuru, I couldn't believe. The girls had more comfort, but I was happy for them. We would have just one jack cardigan which the sisters gave us. We would have wanted the blankets that the sisters gave us. We didn't have anything like, because the parents were not that eager to send their children to school. So why should they be giving you blankets and, and, and <laughs> extra things? But when I was called to Limuru, Loreto Limuru, my mother took out the best blanket from her bed. And she said, Limuru is so cold. I, I, never, I didn't used to sleep at night. It is so cold. So she, that I remember those things she gave me. So, and your mother was happy with the education she received then? Ah, yeah. My mother became a teacher. She was a teacher, all her five sisters. And those earlier women were, became teachers. Or even if they had primary school education. But you'll be amazed. Later on, when Lo sisters opened Kiambu, Loreto Kiambu teacher training, I think that's the best, the best uh, thing that ever happened to have opened Limuru Kiambu as a teacher training college. You know, teacher train teachers are so important, and they were very well taught. Two years. Now, when later on, when I was going to the villages doing the works I do or whatever. I would find the chairman, lady of the pastoral council, the leader of the women's, the one teaching catechism, women's organizations, is from Limuru. She would come and say, oh, do you know Sister Teresa Joseph? Do you know Sister Fidelis? Do you know Sister Joseph? Oh, dif different people. Those who are from Limuru and Kiambu, the sisters, they, those who worked with the African girls. And I, I really can say I used to be very proud up to now, most of those have retired. We have a new generation. The new generation are lawyers and magis and doctors. It's a different crop. And <laughs> they are not so much in the villages, you know. But when I used to meet them all over the country, they would talk of Limuru and Kiambu and the sisters. So I have no doubt. When you say that the uh, Irish sisters really wanted the education of the African girls, do you have any concrete examples of that or stories? Of, of what? Of how, how much they wanted the... You, you know, Father, uh, when you want something and you love people, it just shows itself. Now, when I entered, uh, and also when I was in school in Limuru, there was no doubt that the sisters spent every minute preparing for school, preparing, like, <coughs> when we came, to school in we reported school all the dusters were labeled all the brooms all the brushes everything was ready it, meaning the whole holiday they were preparing for the boarding facilities you know the beds the mat the uh, the windows the window whatever curtains so they they and also 
I get, became a teacher in Loreto and I was teaching with them. Like Sister Okono, Maureen. Every minute she was marking. She near, you know, real, a bit too much. Every minute, the whole holiday, she's preparing for the next term. She's marking for the last term. Like full time, full time dedication. I'm, sure, I'm afraid we are not like that today, we sisters. Is she Absolute. Teaching? Yeah, she taught me a bit. Mm. I know her brother. You know her brother? Mm -hmm. Oh, Maureen O'Connor. Ah, she was a great teacher. Today I was talking about her. My own blood sister became a teacher at Loreto Valley Road. She had just retired for 30 years. Now she was in Loreto Valley Road teaching English. She told me herself, when Maureen was there, Sister Maureen, she would teach from one and two. And she would hand over the children to my sister, Mrs. Gasanja, from three and four. And she said the difference, she had no problem at all. It was plain sailing, teaching, but later, when you have a, a, she got different people teaching from one and two. We were talking about teachers being rewarded for good results. And we were saying, really, it is the fundament, the foundation ones who should be rewarded, not the one now getting A's. And I gave that example. Mo Sister Maureen was Dara. You know Dara? She, 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 she did Dara work, work, and her children passed very, very well, her students. I have that concrete example of my sister telling me how, how, how good it was teaching those children. And what a year did you, you were? How many years in Loreto Limur? Limur was four years, four years. secondary school. And what a year did you leave? 64 December. 64 December. Yeah, we used to do Cambridge British exam. There's Cambridge certificate. Somebody told me that the sisters would keep a copy of the papers that you wrote in case the ship went down. <laughs> that, that may have been before me. I don't know. That I don't know. That I. How would they keep a copy? They would be photocopy. I think a uh, carbon copy. Maybe. Probably. No, that is not my time. Okay. It could have been Musangari. You know, Musangari was from twenty-one. Okay. I I am coming at sixty. Sixty-one. Yeah. And um, how about sports? Did you did you play netball or hockey? Or yeah, we we played a bit of netball. And uh, not so much hockey. Limuru didn't have a lot of facilities. It was netball and game exercise, volleyball, not, not much beyond that. We didn't have tennis or swimming, which they have now in Limuru. And mm. how would people pay the fees? Would the students be able to pay or the nuns raise money for the fees? Or? You know those days, do you know we were very few in secondary school? And secondary schools were very few. We had Alliance, Loreto Lumuru, I don't know what else, less than 200 children doing Form 4 exam, girls. Now... In the whole country? In the whole country. It's not like now where they have thousands. We, we are very special people. <laughs> doing Form 4, we were extremely educated people. Now, the government was also encouraged. Do you know we used to pay, the, the fees was 300 shillings per year for the boarding. And for me and the people around... 300 shillings is $3 now. <laughs> per whole, per boarding school. F feeding, f you food, we used to get soap, everything. We used to get a cardigan, uniform, blankets. We, everyone got four blankets. The bed we made, we, we made the bed. We tell the girls now they can't believe. We used to cut grass, this grass, dry it. And then make get, we got some hard material like this. They make uh, jeans that hard material, and we would get each one. And you make your that was the mattress. So if you were not well trained at home, and you cut grass with the sticks, you didn't you don't sort it well. At night, of course, you it would be poking you. <laughs> that was no. We had great fun. That and then our government. The chief and that used to give us half the bursary. In other words, I paid 150. It was hard to get it. Some children would be sent home. But my father used to pay 150 a year, which was a lot of money. You would buy a plot with 400 shillings. You know, a plot of land which is now up to 10, 20 million. So you see the value of money. So um, 
the fees were, was very little. People didn't want to go to school because you could become a teacher with the only primary school. So why should a girl go to another four years? <laughs> he thought my father was wasting so much time because all of us went to secondary school. Hmm? And we used to be told one day you want to pay and you do not get a chance, <laughs> which has already happened. Do you remember Sister Columbia? Columbia was the superior of the house, but she, she didn't teach me. She was an important person. She was, she was, she was overall. Yeah, she did. And when did you start thinking that you might want to become a Loretta sister? Uh, you know, I, I really can't tell. I think I wanted to become a religious something from when I was very young. You know, my mother was very pious. And my parents were good, fervent Catholics. But they didn't talk about being a nun. But when I was in Precious Blood Primary School here at Riruta, I remember even saying I want to become a nun when I grow up. But they never told me to join them, but I would be one of them. And then, so I had this desire, which was not concrete. But I knew a, a bit what to be religious was, and I aimed at that, at the background, you know. Not Loreto as such, yeah. But later, they did, they were not taking Africans anyway. Yeah. No. When did that start? We were the first. So when we were in Form 4, uh, Sister Maureen came to, to Loreto and she was telling us that um, they are going to open an officiate and uh, one girl already is going to join them. That is Sister Luanga. She was in Kiambu. But I never said anything. Now, I remember on the day the Uganda matters were canonized. It was 1963, I think. That day, I remember I decided I'm concretely, whatever inspiration I got, I'm going to be a religious. But not Loreto as such. And I wanted to become Loanga, like Charles Loanga. I decided I'll be Sister Loanga. Interesting. Yeah. And Ephigenia came later, right? Ephigenia is my baptismal name. Baptismal. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Did you have a name in religion also? I was Kizito. What happened is I wanted to become, I chose Luanga a year earlier when I was in Limuru. When we came to Loreto to join, the sister said Luanga should be Sister Luanga because she's older, but she hadn't chosen it. So she was called Sister Luanga. You know those days you got the name. So myself, I think was a bit annoyed. And I said, I'll be Kizito. Kizito was the youngest. She died at 15. He died at 15. He was not even a, a Christian. She was, he was a catechumen. <laughs> I said, then I'll be Kizito, who was the youngest. <laughs> so <laughs> I was Kizito for three years, I think, or four. So when, when we were told to go back to our names, I went. Yeah. And where was the novitiate that you entered? Loruto Msangari. It was new. Sangari. Yeah, we, we, we cleaned the floors, the paint. It was still smelling paint when we entered. <laughs> it was beautiful for us, for the first Africans. Mm. And you must have felt very proud and privileged to be the first Africans. Oh, I, I don't, think, I don't think so. Life was a bit tough. Yeah. I don't know what I felt. You know, I think uh, religious vocation is very strange. I didn't, or perhaps I was naive, but I was an intelligent girl. I don't know what happened to me. I wasn't thinking anything. I just wanted to become a sister. So I did seriously whatever I was told. I nearly died. I was, I was so serious. One day I just fainted in the church, off completely. I was so serious. And were your Irish superiors tough or were they helpful? Or? You know, Father, uh, oh no, I think it was just like, um, I think it was like the military, you know, when you join, <laughs> you have to be broken. But we were not tough. I think we were gentle little people. But I think they thought we were tough. So we got it. It's a regime. The regime. 15 minutes, everything. And you know, I never had a watch. So, <laughs> so looking at a watch every 15 minutes was difficult. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I did it. I just knew I have to do what I'm told. If I'm told to, to clean the... the the chairs upside down and the, uh, under the table, I just did it. <laughs> I was very obedient. Hmm? And then you did your teacher training in Kiambu? 
No, 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 no. Kiambu was a primary teaching. I went to, to Kenya Science Teachers College, which was secondary, secondary science teachers for three years, as soon, straight after I finished. And did, what, did you learn to teach specific subjects? Or? Yes, we trained for the three years to teach two subjects. I did physics and chemistry to teach that in secondary school yeah and where did you teach then after that i went first teaching was in mombasa we had a school there saint luanga it was a wonderful school mixed boys and girls it we used to go from the mainland to the from the island to the mainland it was a very good school i remember it well and then after that i went to limuru where i was and again Oh no, the teaching was very, I loved it. And the girls are, the Muru girls are very clever, you know. So you just teach and they absorb and they, you enjoy it. They do the homework, they ask you questions, they, they do whatever you tell them. A lot of girls. How long were you in Limuru? Limuru I was one year. Later on I came again for another year. And how long in Mombasa? Mombasa again one year. I was going every year, one every year. Every year to a different, it's tough. And those were years just after independence, no? We joined after independence. Yeah. So there must have been difficult years. Uh, when, we, when I was in Form 4, that's when we got independence. It was difficult because, um, like now, Msangari, there were perhaps one or two or three African girls in the school. It was a European school. And all the teachers were European. Of course, all the, the nuns. So you see, we were like, we were like odd fish. <laughs> it was not very easy. Were you treated well or badly? Or? We were treated well, but, uh, you know, trying to make us learn how to eat uh, European food. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd not, I don't think I'd ever eaten toast and bacon and egg. Those days, life was good. Looking back, I would love it now. But at that time, I used to ask them, why are you eating salt and meat and baby food, mashed potatoes and this oat, oat porridge? If I used to, uh, it was very difficult. They were trying to make us really civilized. But you know, we were used to Githeri and Ugali and Sukumawiki. And really, it was a bit tough, but they, they really wanted to make us, <laughs> give us good life. It was not very, very easy, good to us. <laughs> and uh, that transition from being European schools to being African schools, that must have been have tensions, difficulties? That was gradual. By the time I came to teach in Musangari, there were more African girls. But those African girls also were from the upper class. We had Kenyatta's children, Kebaki, Moi, embassies. You know, Loreto was about the only, at that time, there weren't many high class schools. So we had all these children and uh, we would be teaching boy as children. We had all those upper caliber. And um, those children were also a bit different from me. Me having, being a village girl, this were, <laughs> But it was not hard teaching them. Children are children. No. It was, it, it was, and I was very tough also. I became tough. <laughs> I became tough. I absorbed it. It's not tough. It's strict. <laughs> I think. And mm. uh, you had learned English in Loreto or in Lemuru, or you already knew English before as a child? Uh, English is, uh, you know, well, I still remember learning when I was in primary school, I'm sitting down, I'm standing up. I still remember, but <laughs> I don't know when I learned. You just learn. But in Loreto, was, I never had an African teacher in secondary. And we also had uh, uh, German and uh, other European sisters in Precious Blood here, the Ruta. So I think I've had... Um, A lot of exposure. Yes. Oh yes. And any anecdotes? your nicest memories of teaching, your most terrible moments? <laughs> uh, you know, Connor, I, I really loved teaching. Uh, and I also loved teaching religion. I, I remember I would miss, if I had not taught, taught religion, I would miss it. It's like prayer, you know, you feel you are... 
so I enjoyed teaching. When I was teaching, no, I think I'm a good teacher. I would always have an experiment. Even if when I was teaching mathematics, number line, what, I would take the children out and work in a sand pit, even geography contours, even, you know, bring even Ugali in the classroom and do the contours, you know, the mold and measurements. I enjoyed it, collect butterflies and teach the children or grow flies and they would be stinking and people are angry with me. But I, I believed you, you, if you are teaching about the fly, you can grow it from eggs to you. So I enjoyed teaching. Now, when I was a novice, I remember going to teach religion to four-year-olds in Musangari. They were literal, they were European, mixed at that time. And uh, one day, I remember this boy, he was a, I don't know who, a Mzungu child, a, a, a Mzungu. And I was teaching about God's presence being everywhere. This child started to run. He got scared of God. So he said, no, no, God can't catch me. I can run away from God. So he started climbing desks and windows. And the rest of the class now became teachers. They all were saying, but the chair is touching you. And the wall is touching you. And the child was scared running away from God. <laughs> I still remember that boy. He was a, a European boy running away from God. I wonder where he is now. That's a long time ago, 1965. Now, I, I also remember teaching a, a Russian girl around 12. She, he was in, she was in my class. See, everybody did religion. And I taught the Beatitudes, you know. Now, at the end of the lesson or in the middle, I don't know, this girl stood up and started shouting, impossible, impossible, impossible. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit that time, you know, communism. So I could understand her background, but uh, I, so I still remember these things. Then when I went to the Kenya Science, I was the only nun in the college. And we had uh, these uh, Swedish teachers. I think they have no religion. So everywhere I stand, somebody would come to talk to me about religion. When I joined the, the sisterhood, well, was I two years old? <laughs> was I forced? It was zero but three years. Everybody, the students, and I was in the garb, you know, I was all dressed up. So I think I was attractive too. Anyway, those are some of the interesting things. So on Good Friday, this Swedish professor came and he was asking me why Good Friday should be good. Why, you good, why should Good Friday be good? You know, I was, I was 22, 23, so, but... Um, and I remember telling, I told him, listen, Dr. So-and-so, you know, I remember. Do you remember the day your wife had a baby, you know? She had a lot of pain, isn't it? But was it a good day for you and her? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, yes. So, so I had some, some, some things I remember. Then this other one was telling me, look, sister, another Swedish professor, why should we... Why should I read the Bible? It is all talking about farming, animals. I, we come from, from town. I'm a town person. So I remember telling him to read St. Paul. St. Paul was, a, was not a villager. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, and after Mombasa and Limuru, where did you go then? I taught uh, Kiambu. I, I taught not Kiambu, Limuru. Limuru. Musangari, on and off. I have only taught there. I have only taught Limuru, Musangari, Mombasa. I have taught in St. Trezas. St. Trezas, Italy. Yes, I was headmistress in Kiambu for three years. Yeah, yes. You could write a whole biography of all these places. Eh? So if I had the time. So yeah. much experience. Yeah. Then I went to, I went to India. I studied in India for four years. Oh, where in India? Calcutta. So, and, um, what did you study there? Geography honors. Mm -hmm. I, I got first class honors. And um, 
Uh, I love geography. I think I've done a lot of things in my life. And did you teach geography then later? Ah, don't talk about that. You know, nuns, I think we are not supposed to teach what you learn. <laughs> but luckily, if it is today, the, the girls would just refuse. But I would come and I would get whatever has nobody to teach, of, including religion, of course. So when I came to Roroto Musangari, they had geography teacher I didn't get. When I went to Limuru, they had chem, uh, chemistry teacher and math teacher I didn't get. When I went to Mombasa, they had physics teacher I didn't get, although I had done those things. So, uh, uh, but I, with God's help, of course you can teach secondary school stuff, it's not hard. So I taught whatever I got, and I got good results. Mm. Did you ever meet Wangari Masai? Only later, later on, mm. later. She was a, a great lady. Mm. What do you remember about her? Uh, you know, when I was teaching at St. Teresa's, she, d she gave me, I just asked her, I told her I would like to start a nursery. Within a day or so, she had brought f f in his so uh, soil, red soil, plants, seeds. She was very efficient, very efficient. She, she would just do the things and uh, execute. Later on, I only met her at, um, when she would give speeches. I was very honored when she mentioned my name as one of the ladies from Loreto Limuru who have sort of contributed something to society. Did you teach her? Wangare was older than me. Older? She, she's a bit, she, she was in Limuru in the six, early 50s, late 50s. I only came in the 60, there, 61. And did you start the school in Eastleigh? Ooh, Israel was started long ago. It was a, an Indian, a Goan school earlier. You know, during the British time, the schools, Musangari was white school, Valley Road, Kiambu was African, Limuru was African, St. Teresa's and Catholic parochia were Indian, and Mombasa was, were European, and, uh, and uh, Eldoret were European. Yeah. Oh no, I, I did. St. Teresa's is an old school. Mm. But the nursery, you said you started the nursery. Oh, it was a nursery. It was a nursery for trees. No, for trees. Oh. <laughs> That's really good. And uh, do you remember any funny stories of the older sisters, Sister Columbia, Sister Philippine? Philippine, Philippine taught me music. Oh. Uh, those people were serious business. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of fun, really. But um, I just, as I said, their dedication they allow for the people and you know they they and especially the sisters in Kiambu and Ali Limuru had a tough life sister Veronica sister Fidelis in Limuru Loreto Limuru sister Dorothea sister Teresa Joseph also in Limuru life was tough also Okono Maureen Okono earlier on they didn't have electricity they had muddy roads they had dirty water from the river pumped up and then during the emergency in central province whenever there was shooting or some problem or the villagers would all come to fill the classrooms leave them filthy with their babies and also the convent at night they suffered a lot with the people because mm. the convent was seen as a safe place or? yes mm. so and it is in the middle of the people so they would all come there they used to say it was very hard yeah and they had to, I suppose, eat the local food also, no? Ugali and Skumbriki. Hardly. Luckily in this country, like, you can always get wheat flour, you can always get eggs, uh, rice, uh, potatoes. Your people love potatoes and cabbage and carrots, and they love the avocado pears, you know, pineapples. Basics. And uh, Veronica, Sister Veronica used to grow things like lettuce, you know they would grow, uh, Kiambu has very good soil, they, they grew them, yes, then they, they grew some fruits, mm. but it was tough. Did they have trouble in those 60s and before that getting approvals from the government? N not really, because uh, the priests were already well established and had a good, um, I, we, I understand the British allocated different areas of the country to different religions. So when the Catholics went like to Kiambu, they would have a big piece of land. That wasn't a big problem. And there was land. 
at that time. And Limuru, they were just next to this convent, St. Uh, Austin's. All that was church land up to Keanda. Uh, the whole of that area, Westlands, was St. Austin's. So it wasn't hard to get a piece of land there. Eldoret, I understand, they were given by an Irishman the, the land they had there, 20 acres, who was a farmer there. Mm. And um, Eldoret was already existing at that time? It's an old school, yes. No, it's an old school, that one. And there was another place near Kitale, no? That is newer. newer. When Eldoret was closed, 1969, they opened, I should say, with uh, uh, right in the countryside, Loreto Matunda, which is driving. That was open, I, think, I remember that one, 69. Is that still there? Oh yeah, it's a big school, two big schools in one compound, yeah. And how did you get into FGM? Uh, FGM, um, you, you know, Father uh, Connor, looking back, I think God was preparing me. Like for my, for my PhD thesis, I, I researched in the countryside on moral education, traditional moral education. So I met the people. Now, I didn't know that God was preparing me, first of all, to rough it in the villages with the people and also to learn about moral, moral education, moral change and culture. I didn't know, but that's what I learned without knowing that I'm going to work in FGM. Now, uh, there is another program I, I, I do. 1988, I went to South Africa for a pastoral workshop, and they asked me whether I could conduct that workshop here in the East African region, in the Amisea region. I went in 88. Loreto sent me. I was lecturing at GABA Pastoral Institute at that time. Now, since 1992, I was conducting that workshop. It's an annual international pastoral program for one month, every year, once or twice. Now, we used to hire with another man, layman, the two of us used to conduct the workshop, and we would hire the centers. When we went to Moranga, Sagana, on off days I would walk among the people, and I learned FGM was very serious there. And they would tell, I would tell them one day I would like to work without knowing really what I was talking about. In 1995, it was a miracle that I went to Beijing, women's conference. You know, we had an international women's conference. Actually, Sister Nula came into my office and said, Sister, would you like to go to Beijing? I said, how can I go to Beijing? <laughs> Only women, we, MPs, we are going. Anyway, she said, there is a group which might sponsor us. Write down what you will do if you go to Beijing. Then I said, ah, I'm not going to do Then I said, what shall I lose? So I jotted something on a piece of paper. I gave it to the secretary down. I didn't have a computer. She typed for me. I gave it to Sister Nula. Today, I don't know what I wrote. What I'll do if I go to... Do you know, Father Corner? I got the scholarship. Nula didn't get. I was so sad. <laughs> it's for her. So... The, I just packed my bags, I had the ticket, pocket money, I went to Beijing. No, <laughs> like that, with the big women there, Nigerian women, women from all over the world, the best thing was the dressing. You just spend time looking at the way people dressed anyway, three weeks. When I was there, I attended some workshops for women from West Africa, talking about FGM. Now, you know, Father, I was shocked about what I learned. What shocked me most was to hear that over 90% of FGM is in Africa. I do know, I had joined the sisters to help African women. You know, I wanted to, be, to educate people because I saw poverty in the village. I saw people who were a bit educated, the women would be teachers, they would have a bit better life. You know, I wanted to raise the standard of living of the women, also teach Christianity. Here, Father, was a big problem with very many consequences to the woman and to the family, and it was brought by the women themselves. It's the women who do it. 
No, father, I got a shock. Then I learned it is Africans. 99% is in Africa. And you know, I'm very interested, of course, in the African woman. Whenever I go to the library, I would check the statistics. Maternal deaths, infant mortality. Uh, you know, you can learn how many kilometers women go to collect water. All over the world, you have maps, diseases, average age. I, I knew these things, and we are the last in Africa. <laughs> Kenya? No, Africa, we are, the, you know, highest infant mortality, highest maternal death, uh, the least number of doctors per woman, the least number of women who give birth in hospitals, you know. We are the worst after India, Asia. So, Father, I knew that about us. We go the farthest to collect water every day, average. So, here I learned this other big problem is brought by us, by women, to women. Do you see, can you imagine the shock I got? It's a big shock. Because my life is to raise women, women's status and help them. So here they are the ones causing harm to other women. So I came determined I'm going to do this and it will be over in two years. Because once I tell the women about the consequences, they'll never do it again. That was 95. But it's not easy, Father, to stop working and teaching and go to superiors and get permissions. So it took three years to finally get permissions pack my bags without knowing what I'm doing. I had use of a car already. I was lecturing that time I had done my PhD. I was lecturing some universities and colleges to stop everything and um, go to stop FGM. Uh, first of all, I wrote to many bishops, can I come and work in your place? Of course, many of them, some said there is no FGM here, although it is behind their hedge. Others, <laughs> the circumstances would be behind the house of the bishop there. And the bishop would, the, or the priest would tell me there is no FGM here. It was finished in 1900. Then, so, Bishop of Muranga welcomed me. So I went there and I worked for four years without knowing where I'm starting, how. But I knew a little bit about research because I did university research. So, I worked for four years there from scratch. I learned from the people, the people I was teaching with, working with, the parents, they would tell me something. I started by going to schools, uh, going to education officers, getting permission, written permission, going to the chief, getting permission. You can't just go to a place and start research. Education, you have to, get, to go to schools. I had an open permission. Everywhere I went, they would close the school, primary school, and give me all the children. I had a letter and they knew my car, I had a yellow pigeon car. I would just enter any school and I would get about two or three hours with all the children. Whatever I asked, I had permission from the, the head person in charge of education. So I did that, I would visit two schools, three schools in a day. Then I, it was difficult. You go to the office, introduce yourself to the headmaster. I did that for four years. Then on Sunday I would go to churches or to women's groups. I worked very hard. Now, from my education research work, I knew every evening to write a few lines. Every evening. So the teacher said, Sister, give us some notes. Kenyans love notes. Is that so, George? We love notes. When you teach, you have to give notes. So I said, I better give these people some notes. <laughs> so because I used to jot things down, and I also would read in the internet about FGM. I, I wasn't very familiar with it. I read, I looked in the libraries, I became really expert in it. So I sat down, I wrote some things, the notes for the teachers. Then I, it was a big manuscript, so I said, eh, this perhaps can be published. So I read, before writing it, I, I, wrote, I phone, telephoned some um, publishers, Oxford, Oxford Ox, these people. I said, I did not have anything, but I said, I have a manuscript here on FGM. If I wrote it, would you publish it? Everyone said, bring it, madam. 
So I sat down. I wrote, I think I took a few weeks to write it. I took, but then being a Catholic, you know, you have to have imprimatur. So I decided, although daughters of St. Paul gave very little returns, I better give it to them because they're proof, read, and get, get the doctrine. So the daughters of St. Paul published that in those notes, although they cut it in half, they said it was very much Kikuyu because I had done the research in, in Muranga. So that's the first thing I did. That's the book, I called it Female Circumcision, although there is no such thing in English. But for the sake of the people, I didn't want to call it female genital mutilation. It's a bit insulting. So I called it female, but there is no such thing in English. Anyway, so I have answering the need of the people. After four years, Muranga women said, Sister, we understand FGM is bad. They I interviewed more than 40 circumcisers in six months. Because in the beginning, I only did Risa talking to circumcisers. Because, Father, I don't believe in, even if I'm talking to old people, I have to know what I'm talking about. So I said, let me find out what is this FGM, how do they do it, who taught you, when, how, what does your husband think about it, how much money do you get, all those things. Six months, I interviewed 40. I would sit with them in the village, and they would give me tea there in the rice plantation area. Sometimes I didn't know whether I was drinking tea or coffee or cocoa or <laughs> because they get the water from the tunnels. Anyway, when I came home, I would go to the hospital or <laughs> when I came to, I got very sick father, you know. Anyway, I wrote that book and you know, people, it was read, it was posted everywhere and now it is referred to. And it's a little book. After that, many people have written on FGM. But I think mine was the first. If I knew it would be so popular, I would have written more comprehensively or even corrected my English a bit better. <laughs> but anyway, there it is. Now, the Muranga women told me, Sister, look, FGM is bad. But when girls are being prepared for FGM, they are taught many things. And they learn how to become women. Now, do you want our children to grow like sheep or goats? You know, they said <laughs> the cows, they are never told now you can get married, you know. You have grown up. But said our children must be prepared. And FGM and all the ceremonies prepare them for adulthood. So, sister, you go and teach people in towns. We are going to circumcise our girls. After working there for four years, they told me to go and uh, teach town girls, those, th those European things. Anyway, Father, that's when I sat down and decided to, to, to write, to create an alternative, a, cre a, 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 a write or passage for, for girls who are Christian, modern, and still traditional. So I wrote a book on that, a manual. It's in the bookshop, Catholic bookshop, Christian write or passage for girls. Then, after four years, I told the women in Muranga, now I have taught you, I had a lot of people had now taught. If you want to circumcise your daughters, it's up to you, I'm going somewhere else, I can't stay here forever. I'm not yours. So, I, I wrote to other doctors, I, was, uh, I mean bishops, I was invited to Nakuru and Gong. Davis, Bishop Davis was a Muzungu, he knew about FGM because he had taught it in the field, pastoral work. And also, in Nakuru was Bishop Cairo. So I went there, I left Moranga people, but I gave them the alternative right, and I had some, some workshops, sometimes with 200 girls, teaching them the alternative them. I taught them how to, to conduct it, and I moved on. Some of the Protestants picked it up, and they are doing very well on the alternative right for girls. So. I'm now in, still in Muranga, in Nakuru and Gong. Gong is very far from near Mombasa up to Lake Victoria, Gong Diocese. And Nakuru starts here after Kiambu goes up to touching Turkana. So I have moved in all these parishes and places. Then there, we learned that boys also are taught strange things. Kalijin boys, Pokot boys, 
um, even Kikui boys, all those who have circumcision, they are those traditions which are outdated, pagan. They are taught very, oh, I don't know everything because they won't tell me, but they are taught strange things. I don't know about George, where he went. And then, they also they are put, uh, they take oaths and they are put into these clandestine movements of different tribes. Mongeke for Kikuyus, Kisi have their own, the people have their own, this, they bring young boys and they give them oaths at night when during these ceremonies so they are told strange things then that's why i sat down and i wrote a rite of passage for christian boys uh, that there is a book i've written is answering the need and it is being used the people who use the boys book most are protestant ministers you see they don't have a lot of written materials so father that's where i am oh, the 100th anniversary of Loreto in Kenya is coming up from 2021. Do you have any idea how many girls have been educated by Loreto? Because I estimate it must be close to half a million. Aye, there would be very many. There would be very many. If you take all those since 1921, even if they were 30, 40 a year on, and then the different schools, Kiambu now would have 600, yeah, six, uh, over a thousand. Let's say 200 a year. Matunda has, I don't know how, you can ask them. No, it's many, many, many. And they have done, and the important thing is the faith. You know, in our charism, we have the care of the faith. It's the faith element, which is very important. And especially earlier on, where there were more sisters in the school, parents and everybody appreciated the faith element that the children got. You know, Father, these days, myself, I can see the results of having no religion in schools. Children don't know that to steal is wrong. Why should they not steal? Why well, they don't know. They know to get an A is good in mathematics. Hmm? And that's why the children who go to Stradimo, to Loreto, they, they are definitely are regarded as, hopefully, with more morals, even in, in the business world, if you have that background. But I think we are all Kenyans, we are also learning to put back morality. So that is the, was the greatest contribution, Father, is the faith, the Catholic faith and love of the church, love of the church. And I also got a lot from home because my father also was in Kaba with the Holy Ghost boys, uh, Holy Ghost priests, and then my mother, we got a lot of faith. It makes a lot of difference, Father. Even now in the project I'm running, it makes a lot of difference when you have a Christian background. It's very important, wherever you are, wherever you are really, I would say, teach children morality and true, to be truthful, to be honest, of course, to have love of God, to know that God is everywhere, we are accountable for our lives, for what we do to other people. It's very important. Looking to the next 100 years, do you see any goals for Loreto, for FGM, for education, morality, <laughs> dreams? 100 years. Uh, you know, I think I would imagine this country would be different, but I don't believe we are going to be like America or anybody. Because, Father, we are starting at different uh, foundations. We are having different elements playing. The, what we are playing with is different. So I don't like anybody telling us we are going to have our churches as museums like Europe. We will not. I believe we are going to still keep our Christianity and even make it more strong, uh, incorporate it with the culture. Because culture, you know, Father, is deeper than some people believe. That's what I'm fighting with in FGM. But you know what? I have learned it will not be over for some several decades, perhaps centuries, because it is connected with traditional culture. And until we learn about it, the culture, you know, what it is and why, our people, are, they are not foolish. They, they won't stop something unless they understand why. And they believe it. 
But you know what? We have not addressed many of these things because they are covered. You know, I wear the clothes like this and somebody thinks I'm like a British woman. I'm not. Inside. <laughs> You'll be surprised, Father. People are Africans. And they believe. And they, they don't even know they believe them, but they do them. They do the practice. And they have the fears. And fear is the worst thing. It's, it's amazing. Even the other day when the president says the culture of wanting to bring down the one who has. Some of these are traditions. Fear of somebody getting better than you. Witchcraft. Then when it is translated into a technical world, it has a different color. You see? So Father, I have fought with the traditions and culture and myths and traditional beliefs for these 20 years with the village working people with the people and I, I believe it's a big thing. It's a big thing. And that's what is holding us back.